Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Vito, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to be here. It's a huge pleasure. And this is a very good initiative of Links webinars. So, and also, of course, thank you uh, all the organizers for this event. Uh, so, uh, to, in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about crystalline and amorphous solid forms of pharmaceuticals. And in particular, I'm going to show you a couple of strategies that we may use in order to address the structural challenges. So, uh, starting a little bit with uh, the introduction itself, so why we are so interested on drug solid forms. You know that to bring a new drug into the market is cost intensive. It takes a couple of years, in fact, to have our new drug into the market. And then during this process, 40% uh, of the drug candidates have poor biopharmaceutical properties and up to 90% are too insoluble in water. And of course, this affects uh, the uh, bioavailability uh, of the drug. So in order to overcome this issue, we can take our drug molecule, in other words, our active pharmaceutical ingredient, API, and then combine it with a second molecule, which should be also biological compatible, and we call it like a co-former. And when we do this combination, we can prepare co-crystals or salts. And here is just a representation of the difference between the two multi-component solid forms. So in co-crystals, you have your API interacting with your co-former molecule via hydrogen bond interactions. And then on salts, what you do have is that one of the functional group of your API or co-former could be acidic or basic. And then you have a kind of acid base reaction. And then you have your charged assisted hydrogen bond interactions. So now the point is that we wanted to locate the hydrogen atom position involved in these multi-component solid forms because this is important in case you wanted to patent a co-crystal or a pol or, or a salt, you needed to know and categorize these according to these specific multi-component solid forms. Then, of course, you can think about bringing our co-crystals or salts into the amorphous state and we can prepare co-amorphous. But also we have single component, uh, uh, single co component solid forms, and these includes polymorphs. We know that different polymorphs have different physical chemical properties. That means that we have the same drug molecule interacting in different ways or packing in different ways. Uh, another category that we may introduce is polyamorphs, more than one amorphous phase. And I hope I can convince you about this new uh, world and the potentialities of actually in including different polyamorphs in uh, new drug formulations. I will show you a couple of case studies on this. So uh, in order to actually categorize all these uh, multi-component solid forms according to the names I was telling, co-crystal salts and even the single components polymorphs, we needed to access the structure and also the physical chemical properties as well. But to access the structure, we can think about a couple of strategies that we may combine in order to get our structure of the material. So if it, we can think in, in general as a jigsaw puzzle, where we have a couple of pieces of the puzzle where we bring them together in order to get the full characterization. So we can start with the X-ray. And it, with the X-ray, we have information about the atomic positions, the distances, the angles in the, within the molecule. So in other words, we solve the structure of our material. But then, of course, if we are thinking about the location of hydrogen atoms and considering that X-ray does not see hydrogens, hydrogen atoms so easily because there is only one electron involved, then we may consider using complementary methods. And this could be using solid state nuclear magnetic resonance, where you have information about the local structure and where you can also locate the position of hydrogen atoms. And with these, you can also study the interactions between the molecules. Of course, uh, solid state NMR, uh, it does not provide you very sharp signals and you will see the reason why is that. Then we need to use computational models, uh, like for instance, density functional theory calculations, where we optimize our structure and then we calculate the NMR parameters that will be further compared with the experimental ones. So if you come up with these three pieces of the puzzle, then you have your crystalline structure solved. But now the question is, when we are working with amorphous materials, what would be the strategy indeed to access to the local information or molecular level information of this material? So I will leave this uh, question uh, to the, towards the end of the presentation. I will show you a case study on this. And now what I would like you is to show you a couple of case studies where the use of X-ray diffraction alone already is quite powerful. And then I will move on for other couple of case studies where the combination of different techniques will be an advantage. 
So starting with the X-ray diffraction, so it, when we prepare a new drug or prepare a new a molecule, uh, the first thing we wanted to know is the structure. And it will be easier if we can grow uh, single crystals of our material. So we have a powder in principle if you do organic synthesis, and then we try to recrystallize our powder to get nice single crystals. And this will be easier because then you can use single crystal X-ray diffraction analysis. And then now we have uh, softwares uh, uh, that already have routine, they are very well routinely implemented, where you can indeed solve the structure in an almost automatic way. So, of course, if you have some disorders in certain functional groups, you may need the input of the user. So, you need to have knowledge on crystallography to actually solve properly the structure. But uh, we have quite good software that can do this for us. The problem is when we have materials that we try to recrystallize and grow nice single crystals and we are not capable of doing that. So then we are dealing with powders and we know these powders are crystalline. So now the question is, can we actually solve the structure of materials only having our powder sample? So in reality, we can. We can use powder X-ray diffraction analysis and we use the ab initio structure solution by powder X-ray diffraction. So there are a couple of steps that we need to consider in order to get access to the structure. And these are just a summary of those. We need to index. So in this case, we wanted to know the cell parameters and the space group of your uh, material. Then we do the polar refinement. So we refine the cell parameters and the space group, and we see if this refinement is correct. And then after this, we can move on to the structure solution. And here we have a couple of algorithms we can use similar to the kneeling and also parallel tempering. They are routinely implemented in softwares like Dash and, Top, um, and Fox, sorry. And then you can use them for access to structure. So then you evaluate the results and now you are looking as well to uh, parameters of the refinement. So you will see the structures that would better match the experimental powder pattern. So technically for each model, there will be a theoretical powder pattern that we need to compare with. And then it's not only based on these statistic parameters, but also because that is a figure of merit, that is a value that we can look at it, but also based on the structure itself. So we need to open and have a look and see the structure. So let's say you have two molecules that are supposed to be interacting via hydrogen bonding interactions, and you have functional groups that are not pointing in a way where favors these interactions. Even though if the figure of merit is good, then we may discard this, this specific um, model because we need something where uh, the functional groups are pointing to each other in order to favor the hydrogen bond interactions. So based on this chemical knowledge as as well, then we can select the best structure, then we do the ritual refinement, which means that we refine all the structures, the distance, the positions and the angles, and then at the end we have our final model structure. So it's a couple of steps that we need to consider. The other advantage of using powder diffraction is that we can um, Usually when we prepare co-crystals and salts, in this case, we use a technique called ball milling, and this belongs to mechanochemistry. It's a green uh, and sustainable method. And the advantage is that you can bring uh, um, these jars, as you see over here, into a synchrotron, and then you can follow in situ experiments. Let's say you want to follow organic reaction even. It doesn't only apply for co-crystallization. Let's say you want to follow that and you wanted to detect intermediate stop reaction or you wanted to know if there is a phase transition between different crystallographic uh, structures, then you can uh, access this very easily with the synchrotron. So then that is a, a combined package uh, of these two. So now moving to case studies that I wanted to show you. We started with barbiturate and melamine co-crystals. So this project is uh, being developed in collaboration with the University of Cambridge with Anna. She's uh, in charge of this project. So uh, we have been preparing a couple of co-crystals of barbiturate and melamine. And we know from the literature since 1919 that there are the preparation of different polymorphs of these specific co-crystals in different shapes like rosette and cricket or linear tape. And um, it is, uh, in certain cases, it's very easy to isolate the rosette form, but the other ones are not so easy. So then we decided as well to investigate how will be these polymorphic transitions using powder diffraction, and especially because there are no structures on the linear tape, for instance, rosette, we have one for a particular system, which is the tiazine with barbital, but we don't have for the other polymorphs. And the same happens for any combination between barbiturate or melamine derivatives. So uh, what Anna did was to combine tyazine with barbital in a cetonitrile, and then she got the one polymorph that has the rosette shape. And then we investigated further 
what would happen if we use now instead of acetonitrile water. So we got a different form from form A. And what is interesting is that if you take a form B and add acetonitrile, then you go back to form A. And when you take form A and add water, you go back to form B. So that is a reversible thing. So at this point, we didn't know the structure of form B. So we went further and solved it uh, by powder X-ray diffraction. And here is how it looks like a Ritual refinement plot, where you have your experimental data on these uh, blue circles. You have your theoretical data in red and the difference curve is in gray. As you can see, it's quite flat, which means there are no big variations between the calculated and the experimental data. Here is the space group, as you can see, and here you have the structure, which actually is a linear tape. So we could isolate uh, this polymorph and even solve the structure. So now moving to case study number two about ex situ uh, kinetic investigations of co-crystallizations. So this was a work that I was uh, doing while at BAM, Federal Institute for Material Research and Testing. We have been working with carbamazepine and we try to produce different co-crystals using different co-formers. You see here there is the 2, 4, 2, 5 and 2, 6 dihydroxybenzoic acids. The difference is that you have the hydroxy uh, group located in different positions uh, in the aromatic ring. And we wanted to investigate if there was an influence of the type of the co-former in the co-crystallization rate. And as you can see here, we have uh, the plot uh, of all the uh, the kinetics of this co-crystallization uh, uh, reaction. And as you can see, uh, for the 2,4 and for the 2,6, we have a quite fast co-crystallization, but the for the 2,5 is a little bit uh, less uh, faster than the other two. And uh, just want to point it out because these are ex situ studies, each data point corresponds to an independent experiment, means that we mill independently each of the data points. And then of course, we also measure independently uh, via PXRD each of the materials. And here is how it looks also the Ritval refinement for one of the uh, co-crystals. So we solved all of them by powder diffraction because it was not easy to get uh, the single crystals of these materials. And here is how it looks like when we do uh, um, the quantitative phase analysis. So if we have, so during each of the data points, we basically have a powder pattern where we can refine the structure of our co-crystal that we solved previously. And we also have access to the structure of the starting materials. So if we find the three of them here, you will see there are tick lines with different colors corresponding to the different materials. And then you can quantify how much do you have in each of the data points uh, respecting to the product or starting materials. Then we investigate a little bit further, looking at the structure itself, what could be uh, the reason why for the 2.5, we have a little bit less, uh, uh, like the rate could be le um, less than, than the other two. So uh, as you can see here, we came up with the rationale. So we have a look at the carbamate spin itself. We can see there are interactions between the amide groups, as you see over here. Then for the co-formers, the 2.5, we also have this kind of motif over here. And then we have an OHO interaction. So when we get our co-crystal between these two components, then we see that the motifs initially present on the starting materials are no longer on the product. So we have different motifs. So this could be one of the reason why it could be delay a little bit. There is a tendency, there is a trend, but we cannot make sure that this will be the reason why it will be less fast than the other ones. But so we can see that is a trend. So if you look to the 2.6 now, uh, we don't keep the same motifs, but instead we have a direct um, interaction between the amide and the carboxylic group over here. But now when we move to the 2.4 that we consider to be the fastest one, then we see that the initial motifs on the starting materials are preserved on the product. And we have actually an OHO interaction bringing together these two parts of the uh, carbamazepine and hydroxybenzoic acid. So now moving to another case study, in situ measurements. So we saw polymorphism, ex situ, now in situ. Uh, we have been doing this project in collaboration with the University of Cagliari and the University of Montpellier. We were performing a chlorination reaction of the 3 ethyl 55 uh, dimethyl edantoin. So here is what we did. Uh, we did, we used calcium apochloride. So we did the reaction in situ, and then we have a probe for Raman. And then we also uh, collect x-rays. So we did both at the same time. That's another advantage that we can do. So in this specific study, we were interested on in seeing the rate of this reaction when varying the size of the ball mill used. So we go from two millimeters to eight millimeters. 
Here you can see uh, some of the examples, two of them, uh, when we use the two millimeter balls. As you can see over here, just to guide you, you have the time over here of milling, and then you have the starting materials. So as you can see, the re reflections of the starting materials are all the way until completing the 60 minutes. And this also happens after two hours, because in this particular case, the reaction was not complete. And you can also see, for instance, the reflections of the products coming up to here. So one reason why is that these balls are quite small, the surface area is also smaller, and uh, the efficacy of mixing the components inside of the jar is not so good. So therefore, of course, uh, the reaction will be uh, incomplete in these cases. Now, if you move on to the four millimeter, then now the, the scenario changes a bit because now we managed to complete our reaction even after 30 minutes. As you can see, the reflections coming down, like can disappear, and then we have the reflections of the product over here. So if you now plot all uh, the kinetics of these uh, reactions, depending on the ball uh, size used, you can see here for the two millimeters, we have an induction period where the reaction didn't occur for over six to seven minutes. And then we start uh, to see some uh, product formation. And then for the four, it goes faster, five, six, and eight. And of course, we have uh, a speed increase with the increase of the ball size. And of course, the efficiency of mixing the components is also higher in those conditions. So now moving to another case study where uh, we were able to detect reaction intermediates. This can be very useful as well. So we were investigating a Knogonagel condensation between the for, uh, um, between uh, um, the nitrobenzaldehyde and malonanitrile starting materials. And uh, we were performing the reaction in different uh, uh, conditions. So we use neat grinding, which means absence of solvent. And then we use more polar solvents like ethanol and DMF, and then a more a polar solvent like octane. What we were able to do is that in neat grinding and octane, we were able to favor the reaction intermediate, which is this um, product over here, as you can see, that is an OH group attached here in this position. And when we use more polar solvents, then we favor the product, which is basically el elimination of water and then the formation of this double bond. So it was interesting because um, we were able to kind of slow down a little bit the reaction. We perform it four Hertz, but we also decrease it uh, until we could actually isolate the intermediate. And here is the powder pattern, as you can see. So the interesting part is that we were able to solve the structure of the intermediate, even if there is a presence of contaminations of starting material, as you can see these stars over here, they correspond to the nitrobenzaldehyde. So we could quantify as well how much we have it from this starting material. So basically what we did, we exclude these peaks index and solve the structure based on the peaks that we are sure that are from the product. So now moving uh, to our jigsaw puzzle, we have been seeing a lot of case studies on using only X-ray. Now I'm moving for other case studies where the combination of solid state and MR with DFT can be an advantage. So, but before even going into the uh, case studies, I would like to briefly introduce you what is solid state NMR very briefly. So there are a couple of interactions between the nuclei and an external magnetic field. And there are two particular interactions, dipole-dipole interactions, means interactions between two nuclei and the external magnetic field. And that is also the chemical shift, which is the interaction between the nuclei and the external magnetic field through the electrons. So these two interactions are involved in an effect called an isotropy. And uh, what is an isotropy? So if you have your powder sample, your crystal crystalline powder sample, you don't dissolve it. So you place it inside of a sample holder. And now you place this router that contains your sample inside of the NMR equipment and you measure an NMR. And you will see that each molecules on these crystallites, they are positioned in specific ways. So what happened is that the interaction between of the, each of the nucleus in the molecule will depend on the position of the molecule. And because that happens, you will see an envelope like this. So you don't see defined signals, you see like a convoluted signals. So if you now look to the case of the liquids, so in liquids, we don't have a static conditions like we see in solids. So the molecules are moving quite fast and therefore the interactions with the external magnetic field are no longer depending on the orientation of the molecules. And therefore the anisotropy effect does not exist. And then you get these nice uh, signals in the NMR spectrum. 
So the idea now is that how can we bring something like this into something closer like we have on solution anymore? So we can use a technique called magic angle spinning, and these actually allow us to suppress the xenosotropy effect that comes directly from these two uh, uh, components, like these two interactions. So this equation accounts with the dipole-dipole interaction, chemical shift and isotropy. And then this is the router where you have your sample. So if you now you take your sample and place it inside of the NMR equipment, and if this router is placed precisely at 54.7 degrees with respect to your external magnetic field, then this term comes into zero and then you can suppress this effect. But of course, this is not so simple as it seems. So you need to also account with other factors, one, one of those being the frequency of spinning. So the frequency of spinning must be larger than the magnitude of those interactions. So in order to actually suppress as much as possible this effect. So now just very pictorically, if you have your sample and if you don't spin it, there you see this envelope as I was explaining before. Now you start to spin your router slowly and you will see that you start to get some sharp lines. So these lines are coming from the spinning side bands from the fact that we are rotating the, the sample holder. But then of course we must have our isotropic value. So the value from our nuclear must be placed somewhere. So in this way, we cannot distinguish where it comes, but then as soon as we started to spin it faster and faster, these spinning side bands goes towards zero basically. And then you can see the isotropic value that you need. So now moving to the case studies, this was a project that was developed during my PhD in University of Lisbon and in Aveiro. So we have been working with azelaic acid, we combine with different coformers to produce salts and co-crystals. And this is only one uh, little um, example where we have azelaic acid combined with morpholine. We managed to produce the salt, as you can see here from the crystal structure. But then what was interesting is that one of the protons it was shifted towards very low values. So a low, low field means like 20.1 ppm or 19.3. This is very atypical for this type of materials. Then we decided to investigate what could be the reason why it was so shielded this protein. So we went back to the DFT calculations. We geometry optimized our structure and then we calculate the NMR parameters. And then we found out that the protein is indeed sitting in between the, inter the interaction, basically. So and this is one reason why it's also so shielded. So this is a way where you can track like unusual positions on hydrogen atoms. So then uh, about direct protonation in natural atoms, of course, you, you can also perform solid state NMR in other nuclei. You can do in carbon and nitrogen. And here is an example. We were working with adamantylamine. Once more, we were preparing several salts with different amino acids and several other acids. And as you can see here, adamantylamine alone is not protonated in this case. And as you can see, it has a chemical shift of 48.0, but now when it's protonated, it's shifted towards lower fields. So as you can see, you have the signals places over here. So this is an indication now that we have a protonated uh, uh, system because here the mine is protonated. You can also do the same using directly a nitrogen and then you can detect the direct protonation. You can see the same thing. So when it's not protonated, it has these minus 317. And now when it's protonated, it goes to minus 323 in average. Then of course, you can also detect weak interactions. And here is when we can use the 2D NMR. So we have been looking at each of the different nuclei we can use on, on organic systems, but now we can also uh, do uh, see like a proton or carbon heterocorrelation. And then with these, we can even identify weak interactions. This is just an example. Uh, so this is the OHO interactions that we can spot it out even here on the structure. Then we have NH3O interactions as well. And now the interesting part comes for this aliphatic proton that is actually engaged on nitrogen bond interaction according to our X-ray uh, structure. And what is interesting is that we can also see the chemical shift of these, which is different from the one that is not involved in hydrogen bond interaction that is placed in the higher value, the higher field. So now for the last case study of this series of crystallographic uh, structures, this is another study that was performed in collaboration with Humboldt University where we were able to collect uh, solid state NMR data. So we were working with salicylic acid and once more, we solved the structure by powder diffraction. So here we just omit the hydrogen atoms just for clarity. But you have the space group, you have the structure solved. But now the most important question here is that when we are doing this, we are not considering 
the fact that this proton may jump to the amine group, and then we have a salt. In fact, if you take the structure and then you put the proton in the other position, you would, you would not see the difference by powder X-ray diffraction. This is why we need to go further. So then in order to understand if this is a co-crystal or salt, we went for our periodic DFDA calculations. We did a geometry optimization first to see if the structure was correctly solved. And here you can see the optimized in blue coming directly from DFT and non-optimized one coming from the Ritval refinement, as I showed you before. As you can see, the positions are correct. The angles and the distance are also correct in the structure. And now if you expand a little bit further on the hydrogen atom, in, uh, in the hydrogen bond interactions, you can see that in fact, the proton that was initially located on the carboxylic group, it migrates for uh, the nitrogen of the imidazolium. So we have a salt uh, according to our calculations. Then to validate these, of course, we use uh, the solid state NMR. And here is just a representation of the two. So we have the proton where we can uh, correlate the isotropic chemical shieldings, which are the values we obtain from the DFT. And then when using this equation, you can calculate the theoretical chemical shifts, which are the ones we in fact compare with our experimental data. So here is just the correlation between the chemical shielding and the chemical shift. It is closer to one when, it, when those values are like this means that we have actually a good correlation. And here is just a representation of the proton NMR from uh, uh, this specific material. As you can see, the resolution was not so good. In this case, we were spinning at 10 kilohertz. If you spin it higher, we'll be having a better resolution as well on your, our data. But the fact that we use DFT calculation allow us to identify the signals and even spotting out this CH pi interaction, which is over here. So now we go back to our jigsaw puzzle. We have been seeing a couple of case studies where we can solve uh, the structure of crystalline materials. How about the amorphous? So we can still access that information and we can still use X-ray, but not in the normal way. So in X-rays, you are measuring bright uh, uh, diffraction, but we can also use what we call a pair distribution function analysis, which is a probability of finding a pair of atoms at a given distance. So this also gives you information about the local structure. We are going to see in a second how this can work. But then of course, if you only use PDF, you don't have a model of your structure. So we need to come up with another method that can help on elucidating this, which could be molecular dynamic simulations. This is what we have been doing. Then we get our molecular models. We can actually calculate the theoretical PDF, and then we compare with experimental one. So here I'm going to show you a case study for that. But before this, just briefly about pair distribution function analysis. So here is how it looks like. The distribution, when you get a molecule, you have atoms at the specific distances. So then you have the probability of having those atoms at those specific distances, and then you have a plot like this. And usually to collect this data, we need to have high energy. So we need to have extremely low uh, or short wavelengths. So we need to go to the synchrotron facilities. And when we do that, we collect what we call a total scattering. So we have the BRAC contribution plus the diffuse contributions. Because BRAC has uh, information about the average of the structure, and the diffuse component or the PDF at the end will have the information about the local structure. So we need to get a, a, a high resolution data as possible to indeed get a better PDF. So you have here uh, how it looks like the curve when we go to the synchrotron and then we get our S of Q. Then we correct this data, the background, and then we sort of have a, a scattering factor. So we have a kind of um, transformation of this S of Q into a F of Q through an equation. And then from this data, because we are in a reciprocal space, we needed to bring it back to the real space. We employ a Fourier transformation, and then we get our PDF data. So now moving to the case study and the last case study of this presentation. It's about hydrochlorothiazide. So this is a project I'm currently developing here at the University of Copenhagen. So I've been working with this molecule and the idea is to produce different amorphous forms using different pathways. So we consider the thermodynamic pathway where we can use spray drying and then we get one amorphous phase after spray drying. You can use the quench cooling or you can use the kinetic pathway where you use ball milling. So what is interesting in this study is that when you use the spray drying, we obtain one amorphous phase called polyamorph one, 
with a glass transition temperature of, 80 of 88.7. So the glass transition temperature is the, the temperature at which, at which a material goes from the glass to the rubbery state. So if we have uh, detected this on our differential scanning calorimetry, that also means that we are in the presence of an amorphous form. So we did this. And we did this for the quench cooling material. And as you can see, there is a gap of 40 degrees, which is quite big. Uh, and then when you do the ball milling, you don't have such a big gap, but we have also a different glass transition temperature. And here is how it looks, our differential scanning calorimetry data. As you can see, different TGs, but also different recrystallization temperatures. Now the question is, are the crystallographic form after the recrystallization temperature the same or different? So then the answer is, it is in fact the same. So you can see our hydrochlorothiazide uh, crystalline here in green. And then if you compare with the other three of them that were submitted at different temperature conditions after the recrystallization point, you can see uh, that the diffraction peaks match very well our uh, crystallographic hydrochlorothiazide. So now what we did afterwards was to uh, investigate how would be if we quench cool now our spray drying sample. Are we going to get the quench cool polyamorph? Then in fact, we got it. But now the things got interesting when we try to spray drying our quench cool material, which is called polyamorph two. Then at the end, we got polyamorph two still. So this puzzled us a little bit because now you are taking our amorphous material, put it back in solution, spray drying, and then you expect that you would get back to polyamorph one, but then we didn't. As you can see here, we have a glass transition of 119.1 and the recrystallization temperature is also the same for the quench cool material. So that means that we didn't change this form. Then we also ball milled polyamorph two and we got polyamorph two still and quench cooling polyamorph three, we still get polyamorph two. So it seems that this phase seems to be the most stable amorphous form produced. Now the question is that, do we have any degradation on our sample that may not be exactly this polyamorph? So we did uh, HPLC and then we confirmed that there is no degradation on these materials. So what we did as well was to ball mill our spray drying sample and spray drying our ball mill sample. And in both cases, we got two amorphous phases. And this is something quite interesting because usually you get like a phase separation when you, you have a polymer with a drug and then you see two TGs, but not in a single component type of material. So this uh, raises a quite interesting point. So now uh, just very briefly to show you the real results from all this scheme, you see quench cooling spray drying. We have our glass transition of 86, 87, then it goes to 119. Then when quench cooling the ball mill, we also have a changing on the glass transition temperature towards the quench cool samples. And then when we spray dry the ball mill or ball mill the spray dry, we have two glass transition temperatures. We are now investigating this uh, a bit better. Uh, this will come up with another publication that we are preparing because this is quite something uh, <laughs> surprising. It's not uh, uh, supposed uh, to happen or at least there is nothing reporting this type of uh, behavior. So now what we did as well, after the, all these uh, measurements, we also evaluate the relaxation properties of the different amorphous forms. So we measure for the spray drying, ball mill, uh, sorry, quench cool and ball mill. And as you can see, they have different relaxation times. So we have 12 for, for the spray drying, which has a higher mobility that it goes faster towards relax quite quickly. Then we have the quench cool one that it has a longest uh, relaxation one. And then we have the ball mill, which is the intermediate one. So that is a correlation between the glass transition temperature and the relaxation per meter. Low glass transition temperature means low relaxation per meter and high glass transition temperature means a higher one, the relaxation. So now that we know that we have these different properties, so different uh, glass transition temperatures, different relaxation properties, now we wanted to evaluate what happened at the structural level. So we went to the synchrotron to collect the PDF data of all our samples. And surprisingly, we get the same PDF for the three phases. So uh, here it's just an example of the three. So we collected the data and as you can see, we have resolution until eight angstroms roughly. And the green one is just the modeling one. I'm going to show you in a second how we did this. But what is important to highlight, the three are similar and there is no other signal that can be detected after uh, eight angstroms. 
So this also means that this is a completely fully amorphous, completely deorganized. There is no kind of, seems to be no, no kind of kind of clusters that could in fact repeat in certain point, or at least that we could detect it via this method. And then what we thought now that we were a little bit shocked about the fact they are similar, we went back to the structure. And then when you look at the structure, we have two places where there be variations, could be this dihedral angle that can vary, can rotate it. And we also have this configuration here that can be up or below the plane. So we took these different molecules and we simulate the PDF of all of them considering the rotation of this angle. And as you can see, they look pretty much similar. There are only very little differences going on, which means that if you sum up all of these, you ended up getting a PDF that looks like this. But the fact that we don't see the differences here, that doesn't mean that we don't have different populations with different type of dihedral angle distributions. So then we decided to evaluate that. We went a bit further, so we did the simulations. In this case, uh, this is the example of the spray drying and this is of the quench cool, but for the quench cool, we also consider a supercell that we actually create defects to get it into the amorphous state, so we molt it and then we cool it down. But we also consider uh, an approach where we place our 100 molecules into a box randomly, we increase the temperature until the melting, and then we decrease until 10 degrees to get our final uh, material. And then on the spray drying, we uh, have also a box of 100 molecules, then we add 1000 ethanol molecules, we spray dry with different velocities where we can remove five molecules or 10 molecules of ethanol at a time at every 10 or 100 picoseconds, so we have a data set of four type of approaches, and here is just uh, the results of the simulated PDF coming up from these two uh, molecular dynamics experiments. And as you can see, they are also very similar until eight angstroms. So this has give us some kind of confidence that the models are uh, approaching the reality, because at this range, we not only see the intramolecular components, but we also see the intermolecular components. That is a mixture, but we cannot differentiate what are exactly the intermolecular components at this point. So then, we were moving and then we analyzed the dihedral angle distribution that was internal to the molecule. So we know we have uh, our HCT over here, we have this angle and this one on the sulfonamide, so we have a 2D plot. And as you can see, for this particular angle, when we spray drying, then we favor the negative value. And then for this one, we have a 50-50 distribution of positive and negative angles because this is a group that is freely rotating. So now if you do the quench cooling, and if you plot the distribution, now you have kind of a good surprise because now you don't have a favor of the negative. Now we have a 50-50 distribution. So now we can see, okay, we have some kind of differences in these different amorphous materials. Now we go back to this scheme because I wanted to highlight this particular transformation. You remember I said quench cooling, spray drying sample will yield the quench cool and spray drying the quench cool, we will keep the same quench cool sample. So now we wanted to understand if the glass transition can be somehow correlated uh, with this dihedral angle distribution. And if that is true, then in, in fact, if we quench cool computationally, if we quench cool our spray drying material, then we should have the distribution closer to the quench cool. And when we spray dry our quench cool material, we should have the distribution closer to the quench cool. And in fact, the good surprise is that we have the distribution of the quench cool. So if you take the quench cool, you had the ethanol, you spray dry, then you still have 50-50. And now if you take your spray dry sample and you quench cool it, then you have 50-50 distribution. So it seems that this dihedral distribution may play some kind of role in the understanding of these different properties of those type of amorphous materials. So now going back uh, to uh, finalizing the presentation, going back to our jigsaw puzzle, I've been telling about these two specific uh, pieces of the puzzle, but of course we need to add much more pieces. So now here I'm just adding these two, they are not directly related with the structural elucidation, but they give important pieces of information to understand the molecular level uh, of distribution of these materials, but of also we need to consider other techniques, could be electron PDF or other uh, um, methods that we may need to explore in order to get more details about these amorphous materials or the structure of these amorphous materials. 
So uh, now to finish the presentation, I have a couple of people I would like to acknowledge, of course, uh, Thomas, because he has been a lot of support during this journey on the polyamorphism uh, project. It has been a good, a good journey and a very good data that we are getting out of this project. Then Yuka also for the scientific support, all people involved in this project. So we have Anna Matson here from uh, Department of Pharmacy, Kirsten from uh, the Chemistry Department. She also works with PDF. And we have also Anders Larsen and Olivia. And I also wanted to acknowledge Eric Jefferson from DESI. So he has given us support to collect all these data. Nordic Pop for funding our trips to the synchrotron and also for divul scientific divulgation. Um, also uh, DFF, of course, uh, for funding uh, my postdoc position. And I also wanted to acknowledge Francisca from uh, BAM in Berlin for all the support she has given to me during my time there, working with all these very nice projects, uh, all people involved on those projects. Here is just a nice picture of all of us before Corona here. So we have been in the Christmas and we went for a nice dinner together. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, my supervisor from Lisbon, my PhD supervisor, Teresa. She, also, she has also given me a lot of support during my PhD. Then of course, Martin, where I've been spending five months and learning how to solve structures by powder diffraction. It was a really, really nice time in Frankfurt. Then of course, uh, my co-supervisor from Aveiro and all the team for supporting also uh, these uh, solicit NMR results that I've been showing, the funding from Portugal and also the collaborative uh, uh, people. So people that were collaborating in all the works I've been showing, Gudrun from Humboldt University, Anna Julian Pet from University of Cambridge, Francisco de Logu and Maria Carta from University of Cagliari and Evelina Colacino from University of Montpellier. And then of course, I want you to thank you for your kind attention as well. <laughs>